This is a Delphini group video about the power of reliable and clinically useful evidence. We want to talk to you about how to solve some very big problems in healthcare through correct approaches to the use of medical evidence. Our focus is on interventions, and our message is that through the use of reliable and clinically useful evidence, you can improve outcomes for patients, reduce harms, achieve better value including reducing waste, and setting the stage for patients to be able to provide truly informed consent. My name is Sherry Ann Streit, and also working with me is my family physician partner, Dr. Michael Stewart. Mike and I work in the universe of evidence-based clinical improvement. We spend much of our time evaluating medical evidence and training others to do so. We also facilitate evidence-based clinical improvement projects, including developing clinical practice guidelines. We've written a six-part evidence-based practice book series. Our books include basics for evaluating medical research studies, applying a simplified approach, help for pharmacy and therapeutics and medical technology assessment committees, steps for performing evidence-based clinical improvement projects, including clinical guidelines, and most recently, a book directed to patients to help them be aware of many of the problems we're going to talk to you about today, and also to help them prepare to better participate in their medical encounters and in making medical decisions. You can find all of our books at our website at www.delphini.org, that's Delphini with an F, by clicking on the sample book cover to the left or choosing books in the menu to the right. And we have a special website directed to patients, but also for providers who are interested in more information about our patient book, why the book's so unique, and why it can help them. And importantly, we are all patients. Here are some things that we all want for our health care. We want quality information to help us make decisions that are most right for us. We want respect, concern, and care. We want the right care in the right way at the right time. Unfortunately, we are in a big crisis and we are all at risk. This crisis has largely come about because of failures to educate our health care professionals who are engaged in health care decision making in what is required for reliable medical science. It should shock you that the vast majority of physicians and clinical pharmacists fail two or three questions on our simple three-question training pre program pretest, And this lack of knowledge has resulted in significant patient harms, missed opportunities for right care, incredible waste, the inability of patients to provide informed consent, and many more problems. The problem is this. If clinicians are not aware of the reliability of the information they provide to patients, patients are likely to make decisions that are not in their best interest. There are many stories of people who experienced preventable harms because of what Mike and I call the medical misinformation mess. We will share one story with you, but know that there are many more. And one of the saddest truths is that in many of these instances, the keys to avoiding these deaths and other patient harms involved extremely simple concepts that every healthcare provider engaged in medical decision making should know and can easily learn and apply. For example, this slide shows you a sample of where our failures to educate healthcare professionals resulted in hundreds of thousands of severe adverse events, deaths, and millions of dollars in wasted resources. A major reason for this is that most healthcare professionals do not have a correct approach to assessing whether a new treatment should be used. The correct approach is to be reasonably sure that harms are not likely to outweigh benefits to the patient. So, in these cases, many thousands of patients experienced harms or at least lack of benefit and resources were wasted. The number of U.S. lives lost in the Vietnam War is estimated at 58,000. We frequently tell the stories of two treatments that caused over 123,000 preventable deaths in the U.S. These two cases alone exceed the individual populations of Springfield, Illinois, Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Berkeley, California, and these numbers severely underestimate the number of patients in the case of one of the treatments as we only counted patients treated by cardiologists and not those treated in primary care. It should further shock you that each of these two stories is represented in two of our three critical appraisal pretest questions. The story that we are now about to tell you involved a cover up. But had more physicians been able to correctly answer one simple question on our test, we believe that would have severely diminished the power of that cover up. Our first case study is about Vioxx. 
But first, let's look at one of the questions on our pretest. A well-done study reports a statistically significant relative risk reduction of 60% for patients in the intervention group. Is this a result that may persuade you to use the intervention with your patients? If yes, why? If no, why not? Respondents in the know will recognize the trap of relative risk reduction, which can mislead by presenting results that can sound dramatic, but in fact actually be very small. This question is the third on our pretest, and you can see from looking at the dark red that few people tested recognize this trap. Physicians are represented on the second line, clinical pharmacists on the third, and nurses follow. You may be curious about the high success rate in other. Many of these people were evidence-based medicine experts. So let's quickly talk about measures of outcomes, which are what help us understand the outcomes in a study group compared to outcomes experienced by patients in its comparison group. Natural frequencies means the count in each group that experienced an outcome. This is the most helpful information to providers and to patients. Absolute measures are one way to communicate the difference between the groups, but by communicating the difference, some important information is lost as compared to the natural frequencies. Relative measures also communicate the difference between groups, but they do so in a way that often makes the difference sound much larger than the absolute difference. Let's take a look at these three measures of outcomes. Over here to your left, we see a chart. We see that 15 people, or 15% of people in the control group died, compared to 10, or 10% 10 of the people in the intervention group. That means that 85 versus 90 people survived. These four numbers are the natural frequencies, and they comprise the two by two table from which many statistics are derived. If we simply subtract the difference in the percent of outcomes between the groups, we now have the absolute risk reduction. So in this case, 5%. However, looking at the chart to the right, if we describe the difference in terms of a proportion between the outcomes, then in this case, we get to say that 10 is one third smaller than 15, and therefore a 33% reduction. Note that relative risk reduction can equal absolute risk reduction, but it can never be smaller, and usually it's a lot bigger. Let's take a look at a key drama in the Vioxx story. Vioxx was approved in May of 1999 and was on the U.S. market for just over four years, causing 60,000 deaths and 140,000 heart attacks in the U.S. alone. Shortly after FDA approval, the VIGOR trial is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mike Here's GI colleagues exclaim about a 60% reduction in serious GI events. Mike retrieves the study. He sees that there is a Kaplan-Meier curve that suggests a big difference between the studied groups. Conclusions are optimistic of benefit. The published abstract presents key outcomes as relative risk. Here's the same information blown up so you can more easily read it. Most doctors will convert relative risk to relative risk reduction, which in this case equates to the 60% difference Mike was hearing about in the hallways. Some safety information was also presented in the abstract. Again, blown up so that you can read it. 0.1% MI in the naproxen group versus 0.4% in the Viox group, which was actually characterized as naproxen being cardioprotective rather than any suggestion that Viox could be harmful. So, to many physicians, benefits seemed very large, and harms, maybe not so much of a concern. And, many mistakenly believed that Viox was superior for pain relief. In fact, no studies demonstrated this. Many prescriptions were written. Many dollars were made. Key efficacy information was available in a table in the study that just eyeballing should have raised questions about such a large reported benefit. Of roughly 4,000 people in each group, there were only 16 serious GI events in the Viox group as compared to 37 in the naproxen group. And, with a simple understanding of the problems of relative measures and a simple understanding of how to compute absolute differences, readers easily could have seen that the absolute benefit was 0.8% as compared to the impressive sounding 60%. We're getting ahead of ourselves. It's okay to look at results to see if spending time with the study will be worthwhile, but the results should not be assumed to be reliable until the study has been critically appraised for validity, which means closeness to truth. To do so, you look for bias and you look for chance. Bias means anything that systematically leads away from the truth, 
Systematically simply means not due to distortion, due to chance. You can't read the table in this slide, however we put it here to illustrate that there are tens of thousands of studies that many researchers have evaluated to document the potential for bias to distort study results. And our critical appraisal of the VIGOR trial demonstrates that it is at high risk of bias. And by the way, doing this critical appraisal probably took each of us roughly 15 minutes. Importantly, research has shown again and again that bias tends to favor the intervention under study. This may mean that the reported benefit of an absolute 0.8% is inflated. All of this gives us a very different summary of potential benefits compared to potential harms. That alone would have many people pushing the pause button, but there's more. GI events were reported using the 100 patient years statistic based on nine months of data. MI, however, was reported in percentages in nine months. Hmm, we asked ourselves, why report them differently? Upon our review of the FDA's recalculation, we're pretty sure we know why. No difference in mortality does not mean there's no difference. It may mean there's simply too few people or not enough time to show a difference. Confidence intervals indicate the mortality difference could be as high as 0.7%, and the article is suspicious for selective reporting in the area of safety. Not even a safety table was included, which is an expectation in every clinical trial. When the FDA recalculated MI using the 100 patient year statistic, the rate is now raised from 0.3% to 0.4%. Further, their computation of all thrombotic events is 0.97%. Harms outweigh benefits just in terms of numbers. Plus, whenever we ask physicians what they would rather experience, a serious GI event or a thrombotic event, GI event wins unanimously. Unfortunately, some key information was not reported in the article. Here's some additional safety information that was only available from an FDA review. Mike and I spent several years trying to help healthcare groups and patients avoid using Vioxx. One day Vioxx came up as a case study in my medical student seminar when I was teaching at UCSD, and my students came to the conclusion that Vioxx was a dangerous drug. To my amazement, the following day when I went outside to retrieve the morning paper, I saw a banner headline. Vioxx pulled from the market. I knew my teaching case would be one my students would never forget. Vioxx died here in September 2004, and unfortunately not soon enough for many people. Celebrex, also a COX-2 inhibitor, is another tale of bias. Celebrex, like Vioxx, rapidly became one of the most highly prescribed drugs in the United States as clinicians tried to prevent GI complications in patients taking NSAIDs. The class study made a very big splash because it reported fewer GI complications than Celebrex. When we looked at the study published in JAMA in September 2000, we found problems. It was a very large study, more than 8,000 subjects with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. It reported lower adverse GI events with Celebrex compared to ibuprofen and diclofenac, which is also known as Voltaren. One major problem was that, although the authors had 12 months of data, they used outcomes at six months and, quote, annualized them, reporting a lower rate of symptomatic ulcers and ulcer complications with Celebrex. The problem with this was that their data at six months suggested Celebrex was superior to the other drugs, however the full 12 months data showed no statistically significant difference. Beyond that, however, as we pointed out, readers should not accept reported results unless the study is reliable, and this study was at high risk of bias. Annualizing results from six months with 12 months of available data is a fatal flaw, and a fatal flaw means the results are not trustable. The authors did not report the 12-month outcomes in the study or to the authors at JAMA. Secondly, the authors changed the protocol six times after the start of the study. Three, the authors changed the primary outcome measures, which favored the reported results, and that's unacceptable. There may, there may have been other problems as well, but these are sufficient to ignore these results. And the FDA in this case did the right thing and reported outcomes using the full 12 months of data on their website, but they failed to alert the public to the issue. 
The problems came to light through an article in the Washington Post. Here are the data at 12 months. Celebrex did not have better outcomes. The FDA concluded that Celebrex did not offer clinically significant benefit over other NSAIDs. But once a study has been published, it takes on a life of its own. Here's an economic analysis done three years later, citing the Celebrex study, and it gave half the weight of the analysis to the flawed class study we just looked at. And it was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a prestigious journal. Right here in the abstract, the authors state that Vioxx and Celebrex reduce ulcer complications by about 50%. Authors made a common error of looking at results before evaluating study quality. The author's economic modeling is clearly flawed with that assumption. Their meta-analysis, showing a 50% reduction with COX-2s, is based on fatally flawed data. The authors of this economic analysis should have critically appraised the included trials before accepting their results. These two cases illustrate one aspect of our huge misinformation problem that leads to excessive spending and other harms. We should seriously consider results only from studies without lethal threats to validity. We started out with the nightmare case of Vioxx. It's but one example of what can happen when critical appraisal skills are lacking. In this case, in the case of Celebrex, in the case of Avastin for advanced breast cancer, and on and on with hundreds of drugs and countless drugs we have yet to see. And in other diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, it's the same. This is still a major problem affecting the work of researchers, editors, peer reviewers, faculty, policymakers, and clinicians. Last in line is the patient who's put at risk. This problem remains huge and is little different from when we started working on this two decades ago, and it's repeatedly pointed out by others. Help is available. We're trying to raise awareness among leaders, patients, providers, and others about the nature of this problem. There's no time for this today, but we want to at least mention that there's another large problem that goes hand in hand with this one, and that is that research has shown that there are enormous gaps in evidence omissions in patient and physician communications, which we personally and probably all of you have experienced as patients. Progress is slow. Currently, we are going directly to patients in an effort to catalyze change. Our message to patients is to be aware of these issues and prepare for each medical encounter and participate effectively so as to get the care that's right for them. Our message to patients, clinicians, and you is that patients deserve reliable and clinically useful information and clinical partners who can ensure they get the right information. So reliable, clinically useful information is the key to truly informed consent and best outcomes for patients with the additional benefit of a decrease in overuse and waste. Transformation starts with all of us, and leaders are crucial. Leaders need to know about the importance of critical appraisal as a basic skill, and they should possess the basics themselves. They should ensure that every quality improvement group, technology assessment committee, and pharmacy and therapeutics committee, and every other work group that's involved in medical decision making has the skills and tools to do critical appraisal and include it in their work. And there's this untouched area of skills in communicating with patients that I mentioned earlier. If leaders foster evidence-based culture and the use of evidence-based work components so that your talk becomes your walk, your groups will eventually have highly skilled professionals who can accomplish evidence-based clinical improvements. So in closing, we emphasize again that without critical appraisal and knowledge about the quality of the information foundation, the rest of the quality improvement work you do is placed at risk. Steps four and five in this set of 10 quick UI steps must be embedded in leaders' minds, work processes, and the organizational culture. The process details vary a bit with each type of endeavor, but quality improvement requires that critical appraisal basics be woven into the organizational culture and into every endeavor where healthcare decisions are made. And we have help for you in all aspects of evidence-based clinical improvement work. We have a lot of information freely available at our website at delphini.org. You can find many resources at our main menu. You can contact us from our site.
Below our main menu is our quick navigator to frequently accessed bits. Thank you for listening. We're seeking people who are interested in working with us to help solve this problem. And you can contact us through our website at delphini.org. That's D-E-L, F as in Frank, I, N as in never, I, dot O-R-G. Thanks again.